The man you are about to meet is one of the most accomplished men on this planet. Greg Reed has written, co-authored, and been featured in over 87 books. Yes, 87. 28 of which are best sellers, five motion pictures. He even has a Walk of Fame star in the Las Vegas Walk of Fame. He has an honorary PhD alongside Tonino Lamborghini. Yes, the Lamborghini. He runs eight corporations and literally the list could go on forever and ever. He is a legend and I am so excited for you to meet him. So get out a pen, get out a paper, take tons of notes because his time alone is worth so much, you guys. So get ready. Let's meet Greg Reed. Greg, thank you so, so much for coming on today. I know we've been in talks for a little while now and we finally made it happen. So, and, and, and I got a fancy haircut, you could tell, just so. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, beautiful. You know, that's what I do for you. That's how much I like you. <laughs> I feel so special. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm really, really excited for this episode. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. So I want to actually kick this off a little differently than I normally do because you're a different kind of guy. Mm. And I have a question that I actually personally really want to know. Uh -huh. And I just know you've had this incredible journey. You've had made so many accomplishments. You've achieved so much success. And one of the things I want to point out, which I just learned about you actually, is for those of you watching slash listening, Greg has accomplished everything from his bucket list, right? That's right. 80, 80 items when I was a kid, I wrote down. And uh, last January, I crossed the last one off the list. How crazy is that? It's amazing. I just, I'm just starting to really kind of add to my bucket list. So it's inspiring. I love it. So if there, if you could pick one pivotal moment in your life, yeah. whether it was in your childhood, your teenage years, your adult life, that really created a massive impact to get you to where you are today and to accomplish the things you've, you've made today, maybe whether it was an aha moment or a turning point, what would that be for you? You know, you and I were talking a little bit about it offline, and it's the difference between seeking counsel and listening to people's opinion. Opinion is based on ignorance, lack of knowledge, and experience like a family friend who's never done what you're about to venture upon, and they're trying to keep you safe. Uh, counsel is based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship. People have paved the way. If you go to a family friend and say, I'm going to write a book, they might talk you out of it because they know you got a D in English and they've never written a book. But if I go to Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, He's going to say, Greg, sit down. Before you get started, here's what you need to know and give me counsel based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship, and experience. Why well, I learned if we would spend our activity only seeking counsel and ignoring people's opinion, that is literally the day your life would change. Mm, I love that. So when you say, because it's such a powerful difference, seeking counsel versus taking on opinions. So what would you say is like a major, like cr the criteria that you use? When you okay, that's great. Someone getting the results that I want for myself today. I'll give you an example. If I wanted to open uh, a brand new restaurant chain, I very good friends with the founder of Chuck E. Cheese, but he did it 40, 50 years ago. So I'd say, okay, five guys are in and out. Who's the hot trend right now? And I'd go to that person and do it. I'll give you an example. When I wanted to become a best selling author, I did not go to people who wrote amazing books. I didn't want to be a great writing author. So I went to Barnes and Noble and I went to the best selling section and I bought every one of them and I called those people and said, teach me, <laughs> go, I want to be a best selling author. And I followed their guidance and here we are today. I love it. Yes. So people who have accomplished what you want to accomplish. Correct. When I went to Africa and summited Mount Kilimanjaro, you know, I didn't ask some dope smoking surfer kid here in La Jolla to take me up the mountain. I found the Sherpa that had climbed it eight, 900 times, wherever they put their boot print. I put my boot print. I just follow the successful actions of others. I got a major feature film that's going to be in the theaters here next week. And I know nothing about movies. So I said, okay, who won Oscars? Who's these top developers? I went to those people, asked them for their guidance and just follow the successful actions of others. What's interesting is that when we were kids, we got in trouble for our cutting to the front of the line. But as an entrepreneur and a business person, it's a must. It's mandatory. So all I do is I say, who is doing what I want to do? I ask them for their counsel and then I put my own spin to it and have the same results for myself. 
I love it. Rather than reinventing the real. Put a new hubcap on it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I love that answer so much. And it's so true. Sometimes we will let the opinions of others, like our parents or people who haven't done it yet, they start, you know, shooting on us. It's something I like to say They're, you mm -hmm. should do this. You shouldn't do that. And we're at the end of the day, they hadn't done it. So how would they know? Um, right. So I, I love that. It's such a, it's a really powerful boundary to draw for yourself. That's right. And it is about, you know, drawing a line in the sand and making sure that, you know, you're taking input for someone that you would trade their life for. I'll give you an example. Someone comes up to me and they're smoking a cigarette saying, hey, you shouldn't smoke. I'm probably not going to pay attention anymore that someone pulls up in a beat up old car and they live, uh, you know, rent a room out of someone's back basement. Tell me about financial advice. So I'm very cautious of who I get my information from, but also there's a slight spin to that. Everyone we meet will know something we don't know. So they might actually have a technique they just never applied. So the only difference I do with my friends and associates is we get great insight, great counsel, but we do something with it. <laughs> and so I'm always paying attention to what that is. Now, I, I know you're, we're going to talk about wealth made easy, but I, I, I want to share something with people listening to this thing. I, well, the greatest aha about, I don't know, six months ago or so, it, it changed everything for me. It says, what if God in the universe actually answered every single prayer and wish that we ever desired, only we didn't like the packaging, so we sent it away? I'll give you an example. I sat there and said, God, I need 100 bucks. Please, dear Lord, I need $100. A guy pulls up in a big old pickup truck full of aluminum cans. He goes, dude, take these off my hands. I'm running late for a meeting. I got to get them gone. They're worth over 100 bucks. I go, get those stinky things out of here. Oh, well, wait a second. I prayed for it. It was delivered to me. I didn't like the packaging. So I sent it away. The chances are my prayer and wishes are not going to be granted so feverishly next time. It's the old saying, be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. So what I realized for myself and super uber successful people is that when we throw it out to the universe, we're very clear in our attention. But then we have a reticular activator. We start seeking because it might just be right in our footprints, right in, you know, on a platter before us. We just have to overlook the packaging from time to time. I am so excited that you just said that. I literally just was writing about this in my journal, believe it or not. So perfect. Wait, I was writing about this. I believe it. Ah, uh, yes. I love it. I love <laughs> it. I love it. So yeah, I was just writing in my journal about how sometimes we'll get so attached to the way that we think something should look mm -hmm. and we have this expectation on it. Like, oh, I want this and this is how I'm going to get it. This is how it's going to come to me. And we get so attached and like rigidly stuck to our agendas that we're not actually allowing ourselves to receive what we're meant to receive. We're pushing it away. Well, and now I'm to the, I'm going the opposite way of this in a good way. So check this out. I realize that we are evolutionary species. Okay. Every time that I've ever, you know, broken up with a girlfriend, I got a better girlfriend. Every time I crashed a car, I got a better car. So to me, when things don't go good and things fall apart, I go, maybe they're falling into place. So I go, woohoo. And I go, man, that must be pretty darn great what's coming next. So I'll give you an example even on that one. If I'm going on a business meeting and I'm kind of iffy on it and they show or they say, hey, I can't make it today. Can we reschedule? I tap out. That's my universe saying that wasn't meant to be. And I don't get upset or angry. I just go right on. That just saved me probably a, going down a road I wasn't supposed to go. And when we change our viewpoint towards that, everything starts changing. Mm. Well, it's a viewpoint that's key. So you have a mindset. The, the reason why I think you, you haven't been advanced and evolving is because that's your lifestyle. It's your that's mindset. Right. Like you created that result. Yeah, these aren't like uh, bumper stickers and stuff like that. This is the life that we live. And yeah. it's really interesting. It's also being open to unlearning. You know, it was really interesting. When you were a kid, I promise you, when you were a kid in school, you had little school books and they said that uh, George Washington had wooden teeth a lie. They said Pluto was a planet. Proved not true. They said you could catch AIDS from a toilet seat. All these things are disproved, but we're taught those things. So sometimes we have to unlearn what we're told because it really isn't our reality and it's not truth. So as a grown adult, we have to look at all options and opportunities so we can see what's true for us. Mm. And it's so true because like even I was just talking about this the other day is when we're kids, if this is actually a perfect segue to talk about your book, Wealth Made Easy. But as kids, we're taught uh, we do chores and we earn an allowance, right? We earn money. Yep. So if you really go deep and t pull back the layers of that, we're being taught as children that we make money 
if we're doing things that we hate. <laughs> Making it like, we don't, no kid likes doing chores, but that's how we earn money. So like subconsciously we're being taught that by the, the way that we earn money is by doing things that we don't enjoy. Wow. Is that, that right interesting? There. No, that's brilliant. That is just so brilliant right there. Great job. So I'm going to put that in my little tickler file and I'll give you credit for that one when we write that in the next book. And it's oh, really yeah. interesting because that is what it comes down to is seeing something everyone you meet is going to have an aha. And if we'll shut up long enough to listen to it and see it, amazing things happen. All right. So we're going to talk about Wealth Made Easy, but let's start. We'll, we'll go to the wealth part later. I'm going to give you the, the uh, aha from that one. Came from a guy who's not a billionaire. And it, but it's, it's, trust me, people listen to this. If, if you listen to one thing I say today, this is the aha, okay? It's called CPC. CPC. This is the secret of everything. Clues, patterns, choices. Understand this. Every single thing that happens is our choice and it's our responsibility and accountability. And as soon as you have this mindset, everything around you will start falling into place and gets easy. I'll give you an example. C, first one stands for clues, the P stands for patterns, and then the C stands for choice. Example, I go out on a first date. The girl shows up 20 minutes late. Well, there's a clue. I go on the second and third date, she shows up 20 minutes late. Well, there's a pattern. Now it's my choice, either deal with it, address it, accept it, whatever, but it's not their fault. They're just late. So the whole thing is it takes it off them and it puts it back onto us. Mm -hmm. How many times have we seen someone do a bad business deal with someone around us and we go, oh my gosh, and there's a clue. And then we see it do it a couple other people and there's a pattern. Then they come to us and go, oh, it'll be different. And then when things go crappy, we get mad at them, yet we have the clue patterns and made that choice. So as soon as we have the accountability and responsibility that the decision's up to us, that's where everything around us starts falling into place. Oh, my gosh, I hope those of you listening slash watching are taking notes. Write that down, CPC, so powerful. At first, I thought you were gonna say cost per click. Hee <laughs> hee. My, but, buddy, no, my, my, my buddy, Mark Anthony Bates taught us that. I think you even know Mark. And it's really, really cool because there's so many of these, you know, ahas that if, if we just, again, that's a great thing and you can write it down. But if you don't apply it, it means nothing. So the only thing I do now is I just start watching clues, patterns, choices, clues, patterns, choices. Look, when you and I were starting to do this thing, you know, this is a tough time to be doing an interview with all the different releases. But the fact of the matter is we had a clue, then we had a little pattern where challenges even doing it, but our choice was to stay with it and to push through and thank goodness we did. And so many people will bail out. First, there's a dream, then there's a challenge, and then there's victory. 99.99% of people fall quit in this minutia when it gets hard. And it's the people that persevere and find the solution through it without getting frazzled. They're the ones that come out on top. Absolutely. Oh, so true. And, and what you're saying that the, what I took from that, what really landed with me was that's you're ta you're actually taking your power back. You're becoming yeah. powerful because you're responsible. Right. You're, you're responsible now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, so key because when we blame other people and we're like, oh, it's their fault. Like you said, it's not her fault, right? Well, when we fault people or we blame people, we're actually giving our power away to them. We're I saying that we actually, like they are there, like when we blame someone for how we feel, when we blame someone for uh, something that happens in our life, we're giving our power away to that person or situation. That's right. Yeah, hundred percent nail on the head. And it's really interesting when we go through life, and we start seeing even our own clues, patterns, choices. I mean, again, we have a clue, say, I, hey, I'm drinking a lot on the weekends. And then I see a pattern of it and people mention that I'm drinking. And then it's our choice whether we're going to deal with it or not. It's not always other people's stuff, but it always does come back to accountability and responsibility. All right, next question. All right. So when we talk about your wealth, your book, so what, what would you say, because I know you interviewed a ton of people. And I, I think this, I find this so interesting and I want to know like, what was the, and I'm sure there was a few. So what's something that pops to you right now as like a common pattern mm. <laughs> that you saw, like a common thread between all these people? Just the old cliches of what we're taught are not true today. So for example, they sit there and say, people with big libraries are wealthy and people with big TVs are poor. Or they say, you know, readers are leaders and all this stuff. And it's complete and utter not true. 
And so I just think the modalities have changed. The realities are it's the consumers of massive amount of content and information become our leaders. But we get it from different modalities. Look, I haven't read a book. I've been published in 78 books, 45 languages. I've, I've probably you know, written more books than I've read. However, I'm constantly up to date on what's going on in society and, and, and interaction. And I meet with people and I learn firsthand. So I think we have to change our philosophies of old school 1900s mentality to today. The same thing, you know, no one's going to make money in starting a coal mine in today's world, but you will starting a brand new you know, website or some type of deliverable. So the modalities have changed. The principles of business have stayed the same. However, we have to understand that times have changed and we need to go with them. Mm. Yeah. And, and some of us, it's like, we'll resist, we'll resist those changes because it feels uncomfortable, but like really those are the spaces where the most growth can happen when we let go of that, right. like our comfort zone, we step out of it. Right. right? And back and back in the day, it was interesting is that again, the 1900s mentality was that first the market was the key to all success. And today that's the kiss of death. And so it's so paradoxical and people don't understand that. But the reality is if first the market was the way to go, then, you know, MySpace should still be the greatest success story or Friendster or what have you, but it's not the way it is. And you start following the successful actions of other people, let them make the mistakes and then they come in there and they duplicate it for themselves. You look at Amazon become the juggernaut that it did, but Alibaba came in, did it so fast because all they did was use what worked from this other service and added their own spin and did it for themselves to a bigger market. And so we have to start looking at that. You know, again, like you said before, rather than reinvent everything, what someone use it? Back in the old days, good humor ice cream guy. You know, there was ice cream, there was a stick, there was chocolate. One guy put it in, dipped it in chocolate, and made a first ever, you know, ice cream cone that became a good billionaire. Well, it's the same thing today. What can we have that's already within our sphere of influence and put it together? One of the people for Wealth Made Easy, his name was Jeff Hoffman, one of the co-founders of uh, Priceline.com. And he says, you know, I, I just do something called info sponging. I go to the store and I pull a magazine of like Ebony Magazine and Latino Life and then business and science. And he goes, I just put all these different things that I would not normally have in my brain and I find a solution. He goes, one day I was reading an article about how fruit, as soon as it's expired, they can't sell it anymore and it's rotten, it goes away. There's so much waste. And then he realized in the airline thing, once they closed the door, those seats were just like rotten bananas. And he went, bing, I got an idea. And it's so interesting. There's so many more solutions. We're just waiting to see them. Mm, I love that. So good. So good. So um, what, when, when you were, by the way, how many people did you interview in your book? Great question. I believe, uh, I don't know, 40, something like that. I, I think we... 40, 50, 60, I, I, I have no idea. And it's really interesting. There's a big difference. There's a, like, there's no Santa Claus, everyone, by the way. So a person whose name goes on a book, that's called an author, okay? But the person who wrote the book is a different human being. It's just like Katy Perry didn't you know, write the song Firework, but she's the author of it. Well, it's the same mm -hmm. thing with me. So what I do is I have the most amazing ghostwriters and editors that take my words and they craft them in a way that people would have wanted to read it. Because if I wrote the book and say, shut the hell up, get off your ass and go take action. they will take it and say, it was a glorious Sunday afternoon when a young bright eyed lad had the entrepreneur, right? So there's a big difference. And when we did this book, Gary Krebs was my co-author who actually did all the heavy lifting. I just did the interviews. Uh, he's the publisher of a company called McGraw Hill retired from there. And he's actually my partner. So who can write a better book? The publisher of McGraw Hill or Greg Reed, who got a D in English, right? So work your strengths and hire your weaknesses. And that's how you get things done. Ooh, juice, juice, juice. I love it. Because we, a lot of times what we do, especially when you're starting out entrepreneur, we try mm -hmm. to do everything and it actually dilutes us. Like your power isn't like, and you're, and you're good with that. You're like, Hey, my genius is sitting here talking with these people. You're, you're awesome with people. I mean, that's one of your superpowers. Like you speak well, you're charismatic <laughs> and you're fun. So it's like, you're using your superpowers and that's getting the most, it's actually, it fuels you even more because that's what lights you up anyways. 
as opposed to, you know, like you said, you got a D in English. I also remember you saying before, like you were dyslexic or you are dyslexic. Yes, I am. I dyslexic. Yeah. I can't read. I can't write. Play me words with friends. You'll win every time. And the concept is I don't look at that as a negative. I look at that. That's my situation. And mm -hmm. I embraced, you know, my lack, so to speak, and went toward it. One of the people I interviewed was Steve Wozniak, uh, founder of Apple with uh, Jobs. And I said, how did you guys do it? And he says, we embraced our lack. Where most people run, we ran toward it. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, Hewlett Packard would make machines that go from point A to B with 20 chips. They had all the money of God. He goes, Jobs and I could afford one chip. He goes, he sold his Volkswagen. I sold my calculator, pulled our money to buy one of these little chips. He goes, so I'd take Hewlett Packard machine with 20 and I'd pull away five and go A to B with 15. And then I'd pull away another five, get it to work with 10. Eventually, we went from A to B using or one chip. He goes, we were not trying to be innovative. We didn't get afford one chip. But by embracing that as an opportunity, we found the shortest, cleanest path. And by doing that, we changed the way people do personal computing for the rest of the world. He goes, where could you be right now in your own business if you stop looking at something your greatest challenge, but it could just be your greatest blessing and opportunity in disguise? Mm, oh, I love that so much. And it's like, I feel like that's a defining what, what creates a successful entrepreneur? Because we are going to come up against it. <laughs> it's inevitable. It's yep. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk and talk there, just painting the, the walls here because I'm getting ready to have a big event here at my house. But I'm gonna show you something that I very rarely have ever showed anybody. So you're gonna, you're gonna kinda dig. Yeah, you're gonna, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna dig on this one. Exclusive. So, yeah, when, when I wrote my first book, it was called The Millionaire Mentor. I was turned down by 268 publishers in a row. And the 269th one said, we'll do your book, but you have to change the title, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Again, I sucked. You know, I got a D in English. I didn't know what I was doing. So I got my first ghostwriter and it went on and became a juggernaut success. In fact, it went to all these different languages around the world, but this is where it gets cool. Check this out. These are the actual rejection letters. I kept every one of them. And all these people that told me no are now my friends, associates that publish all my books that go to a worldwide audience. How crazy oh, is that? My gosh, okay. So for those of you who are listening on the pod and not watching, Greg just showed me, he pulled out a drawer and he just showed me all the rejection letters that he got. And he keeps all of them and actually uses it as a source of inspiration. That's right. Uh, that's, that's I, won't, I, won't, I won't let people tell me what I can and can't do. That's it. You know, I, I know what I'm capable of and I go for it. You know, it's, it's kind of the same way with making this movie or doing anything. Everyone will tell you no. They'll give you their opinion, uh, but not everyone will give you counsel. And now this, by the way, is my private library here. And this is kind of cool. Check this one out. Uh, let me see if I can find it. This book is the last one that I know of that Napoleon Hill signed right before he died. So check this out. It's all shaky, his autograph. Oh my like, God. Isn't that cool? And then wow. these are a bunch of the, you know, the different books and the, all that good stuff. But You were telling and, me about your library. Yeah, you gotta come check it out. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty cool. In fact, people listen in, I live in San Diego, I recommend you come by, hang out and check it out for yourself. But back to the point is that if we surround ourselves with people, you know, that just give us their input based on their ignorance or lack of knowledge or inexperience, we're never gonna get anywhere. But if we surround ourselves with people that are doing what we want and getting the results we want, eventually we start getting it for ourselves. Mm hmm. And so actually I actually have an interesting question for you around this. When you decide, because you, I'm sure you have your, you know, close circle of people that you surround yourself with, right? And then you have people that are kind of acquaintances. Have you ever been in the position where someone you're realizing that someone in your life isn't a great, let's say, influence or doesn't really match your, isn't in alignment with you? Mm -hmm. Have you ever awesome. been in that sort of situation? I'm in that on a nonstop basis. And okay. the only thing is clues, patterns, choices. So this last year I've cut probably three or four major relationships that I've had for the last, you know, long time, many years, because it wasn't feeding me anymore. And there's a great quote, if it feeds you, feed it some more. And if it eats, you kill it. And I realized that I was feeding stuff that was actually holding me back. And so what I did is I had to let those things go. 
And I also realize that it's very important to understand the difference between who we're sharing our information. Look, I'll give you an example. My buddies I go golfing with and play poker with, they're awesome. But I'm not going to talk about my business stuff because they just won't get it. On the same note, I host a mastermind group at my house with the greatest iconic people in the world that nobody knows about that we get together every couple of months. And those people, I say, hey, I got this crazy idea. I'm going to make this move. I'm going to do this thing. What do you guys think? And I get feedback based on that counsel and people telling what's possible rather than, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, all just pointing out the challenges. Look, we can illuminate the negatives, but we also have to do it with a positive way. And you can never say a negative statement as long as you say it with a positive manner. Okay. Back to Welcome Made Easy. After going on this journey of meeting these people, you know, a couple of little things. I'll give you an example how simple, like, is Wealth Made Easy. There's a point for it. Uh, I, first guy I interviewed, this billionaire dude, and I said, how did you make all your money in dirt? And he said, time plus land is wealth. I said, what do you mean? He says, all I do is look for a town that's growing exponentially about 25% a year. Go on Google Maps, it's free. He goes, I look for Broadway, Main Street, and I draw a line out eight miles, and I buy the dirt. I rent that dirt to farmers who pay the lease, so it's free to me, and I get vegetables all those years. As a town continues to grow at 25%, it ends up on my plot. Since I'm on Broadway, Main Street, I own the biggest amount of land, and that's what I sell to the big box stores for 800 times what I paid, a billion dollars. And I realized that every single person I sat down with, whether it was from gold or sunken treasure or whatever they did to make their wealth, they had a hack. And when you read wealth, made easy, each page is one of those hacks. So I spent three days, three hours with each of these people and I listened to them and at the end of it I said, so what you're saying is, and I reduced it down to one page. And I realized people could sit on the toilet and get a hack every day, right? And the whole concept is, how can you digest simple information in a way that is, you know, consumable, but more importantly, applicable? I love it. Okay, so give us like one of your just pick one, just to give us a little sneak preview. Pick, pick maybe one hack. You can even just give us a sneak preview of the hack if you want. Well, but what's like one that sticks out to you right now? So well, we'll start with Lamborghini. You know, I was sitting down with the Tonino Lamborghini. I go, how did you and your dad create Lamborghini? You know, how did you create so much dough? And he says, that's easy. He goes, all you got to do is create a product, good service or experience that people will save all their money to happily hand it to you. Because you'll never have to do an ad, you'll never have to do nothing. I went, what? He goes, look, Greg, no one's spending, you know, saving all their money to buy your book or to go to your seminar, but they're cashing in their 401k retirement to drive one of our cars. And he goes, guess what? You're not going to spend $3,000 a night to live in your own apartment. He goes, but I guarantee you, you're cashing in the entire family vacation fund to go to Anaheim and give it to a mouse with big ears. He goes, if you can create a product, good or service that people save their money to hand it to you, You'll never have a complaint, a chargeback, and you have unlimited customers for the rest of your life. Huh. Wow. Well, that is, I love that perspective. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's so many, you know, sitting down with all these people. I mean, even like, uh, you know, the Steiner Sports, the founder, Jason, and, you know, back to dirt. I mean, most people just walk over so much abundance. He, he was, he's the top guy, uh, Steiner Sports, is if you ever wanted sports memorabilia and you get it autographed and stuff like that. He's that world top guy in the world. And he realized in 2007, eight, whenever the economy collapsed, no one was buying that stuff because they couldn't even afford you know, rent anymore. So they started making those you know, boxes, the ones that are made out of you know, whatever it was, plastic, so people could put their sportsman memorabilia inside. And he was making more money just selling the empty boxes than even the product. And then he realized that Derek Jeter shoes were selling for 400 bucks autograph, but if they had dirt on it, they were game use, you could sell for $4,000. So when they started tearing down these stadiums, he went and got the rights to scoop up all the dirt around the field. And he started putting it in pens and keychains and made millions of dollars just selling dirt. And he, yes. And the concept is that's what happens. Most people literally walk over opportunity. Mm. Mm. Yep. There is an abundance of opportunities, things we would never even think of. But once we step outside of our box, and look at it in a different way that we haven't looked at it for before, perhaps. Sometimes yep. stuff will come to you that sound absurd and sound crazy, yeah. but end up making you a fortune. <laughs> yeah, this guy from Oceana, the TV, uh, there's a Discovery show. He basically has got that ship and he goes find sunken treasure. That's his full-time job. He's a treasure hunter. And he pulls up all those, you know, ink and boats that 
sunk with billions of dollars of gold and bullion and stuff. And what a job, right? <laughs> to go live and play. But it's so interesting. Everyone from the guy who started prepaid, you know, phone cards down to the founder of Ugg Boots, down to all these different people. Someone did something different. But it all started with a dream, and then there was a challenge, and then came victory. The only reason these people were telling stories about is that they kept persevering through their challenging time. So here's the deal. I got five more minutes. Any last question? Yep. I was, wow. Okay, we're, we're in sync, Greg. All right, I want you to remember this. You and I right. are in sync, because I was literally just going to say, okay, because we're coming near the end of the episode, and I, you've already you've dropped so much. And I'm, I really hope those of you are listening, not just taking notes, but like Greg said, going into action, taking action is key. So what would you like, what parting, what parting takeaway or what, what parting gift do you want to give to our listeners that, that is about something they can do to take action in their lives right now after they listen to this podcast episode, because so many people, they consume, they watch, they listen. Okay. And what really creates the success is what taking the action. So what's something that you want to leave with our listeners right now? Okay, this is gonna hurt your head a little, you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you right now. So before I go to this one, just get ready and you're gonna be angry that I left with this, but here's the way it is. Okay. So I realized that everything I ever wrote in my other 78 books about wealth, you know, just money, not purpose, not passion, all that's real, but everything I wrote about wealth building was wrong. And I had the greatest epiphany. It's, it's the last chapter of Wealth Made Easy. I sat down with this multi-billionaire. And I looked at him, I said, why are you a multi-billionaire and I'm not? And by the way, he's coming to my house in a couple of weeks for prosperity camp. And he goes, that's easy. He goes, you believe all the bullshit lies that you spread the world. He goes, you are the suppressor of all mankind. You and all your friends and we appreciate it. And we'd appreciate if you continue that journey because you're the person making us wealthy. Oh. I went, wow. And I says, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're the purveyor of the greatest lie that's ever been told. You put bumper stickers and memes and he goes, he goes, you're the one who keeps us all in the fat cat house. And I go, what are you talking about? He says, you teach people to find their passion and the money will follow. I go, yeah. And he goes, it's the greatest lie ever told. He goes, keep spreading that. He goes, he pulled out a phone with one of my memes that said, follow your passion and not a paycheck. He goes, and you wonder why you're broke, you dumbass? And, I'm like, <laughs> and he says, look, he goes, you'll find a guy who's a welder their whole life. Admirable field. They finally retire with some nest egg. They go to Tony Robbins seminar and they open it up a yogurt shop because they get all fired up to follow their, their passion. He goes, 95% of businesses fail the first year, not because they're not eager or trying. They're a welder and not a yogurt guy. He goes, but it's their baby, their passion. So they hold on too long. And when they go down with the ship, they pull their car and their boat and their house. And he goes, yes, and we come right in and sweep that up for pennies on the dollar. Woohoo! And I went, what? And he goes, look, he goes, successful people look for and capitalize on unexpected opportunity and we build wealth in abundance. Go, what do you mean? He says, we're like a game of Frogger. We ride a log and as soon as it dips, we jump to the next log. We can never go down. We don't care. It's just business. He goes, but here's what's great. We build so much wealth, so much prosperity that we use that money to finance our passion. He goes, you guys do it in reverse. I own the stadium. I own the football team that everyone on the field is literally given their life for a couple million bucks following their passion. He goes, the sheiks in the desert, the Gettys, they had no passion for crude oil. Waste management has no passion for dirty diapers and rotten cheese. The aggregate dealers have no passion for sand and gravel to build the freeways, but they built every university, the ballet, the arts, everything that we know and love. He goes, until you can change your mindset to wealth rather than just passion, You'll never understand the power of true abundance. Mm. Gotta go. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh my gosh. Okay, I know. We're going to have to do a sequel at your, in your library. I hope you know this. <laughs> That's good. Done, done, and done. Uh, and yeah. I want to say thank, thank you for having me on. And again, thank if I can be so of contribution much. to anyone, find me on the internet. My name is Greg. I look forward to talking to you. Thanks, Greg. Bye.